Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Hey, it's Eli, and I want to tell you about Magic Mind, a little magic elixir that makes you focus better on your work, be more creative, and drink less coffee. I've got a special offer for you, the listeners of Heritage Radio Network. All you have to do is go to www.magicmind.co forward slash HRN, and you can use the discount code HRN at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman, chef and owner of Samisa Restaurant. On today's episode, I welcome Chef Jay Jung, the chef and owner of Cajun, a Korean Cajun pop-up currently operating in New York City. Chef Jay was born in Korea and left her family to enroll in the Culinary Institute of America in New York in 2009. Upon graduation, she moved to New Orleans, where she became enamored by Cajun cuisine while working at some of the finest restaurants in the city, including Dominica and Herb Saint. Jay continually honed in on what would become Cajun, spelled K-J-U-N, during her time in New Orleans and even after moving to New York City in 2014. In New York, she has worked in some of the finest restaurants in town, including Oceana, La Berna Den, The Nomad Restaurant, and most recently as the sous chef of Café Balloud. In 2021, she launched Cajun as a pop-up operating out of a ghost kitchen, introducing New Yorkers to the exciting blend of Korean and Cajun flavors. She has been featured in the New York Times, Eater, Food & Wine Magazine, Bon Appetit, The New Yorker, and Bloomberg Pursuits, which recently named Cajun one of the best new restaurants in New York. She's appearing on this season of Top Chef 19, and on this episode, we spoke about growing up in Korea and moving alone to the U.S., the cuisine of New Orleans, and finding your own culinary style while working in some of the best restaurant kitchens in the world. Now, on to the episode. Between Oceana, La Bernadette, Nomad, Cafe Balloud, is there one spot that has been, that was the most inspirational for you and where you learn the most about being an actual chef? Uh, I definitely have to say that my experience at Le Brandon was, in, uh, well, I would say the my experience at Le Brandon was so inspirational, and I have learned so much from there. Uh, not just about cooking, but having chef Eric repair every day, checking on your mise en place, and tasting your food every day, and also. Uh, you know, one second. <laughs> one second. Uh, my experience at LeBron then was the best experience for me. Uh, I learned so much about details and also having the chef, you know, air repair all the time. Every day, he checks on sauces I make. He checks on my knife cuts and he checks the doneness of my fish every day. <laughs> that was for me very inspirational. Um, seeing the chef working very hard and being consistent, and that actually was a great opportunity for me to hone my skills and taking everything to the next level. What's really incredible about him that I've heard secondhand, I, I don't know him personally, is that he actually is truthfully in the kitchen. You know, he is in the thick yeah. of it uh, during prep, during service. He obviously has an amazing mm-hmm. palate. He knows what goes yes. together well, and he's very creative. But mm-hmm. even just you're saying that he's doing 
you know, small things like checking your mise en place, checking your knives. Yeah. Um, what do you take away from his leadership now that you're running your own kitchen and going out on your own? How has that specifically Eric Chef Repair, how has he influenced your leadership style and what you pay attention to in a kitchen? Yeah, so my a little over two experiences, uh, two years of experience at Liberna and then taught me every day, what would you do if you are the chef? And then when I was at Liberna and then actually, I was always thinking, you know, I was, I, it was a great opportunity to have a chef every day in the kitchen and putting myself into his vision and what do, what would he say about this or what, who, what would he think about this? And just being in this position for over two years have me taught, it has taught so much like, uh, like being calm, but also being creative. Also, of course, he has an amazing palate. And also sometimes he asked me to just, Jay, can you make Korean style abalone? And he wanted to just, he was always so open-minded. And that for me, for me was very inspirational. And he um, just asked me to make Korean abalone one day. And he, you know, he told me, you know, sky's the limit. Just be creative and have fun with it. Don't worry about, you know, budget everything. Just be a chef and create your own dish. And I was so excited that day. I couldn't sleep for a couple of days just thinking about making, like a, you know, great dish for the chef. And also they have an amazing team that has been working for them over decades. That I believe is the key for the success as well. And the way he treats his staff and chefs and everybody is just for me was very inspirational. He definitely has a, like a leadership, but it's not scary or threatening everybody or intimidating. I would say he's definitely more <laughs> uh, friendly and but he always knows. Just in a glimpse, he knows something is wrong and you don't. Um, for me, it was just everything he's, you know, being in the kitchen with him was just amazing experience. Did you always want to be a chef? Did you have a different career or growing up? Did you think that there was something else that you would end up doing? Or has this always been kind of a, a lifelong passion for you? Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I was in 20s. Um, I went to uh, college and studied in journalism because I thought it was fun and there might be some opportunity for me to do something with it. And I still was figuring out after the graduation and I wanted to be a, a flight attendant traveling the world. I thought it was really cool. And but like I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my mom says, since you can speak English, you can work at my friend's company, you know, as a translator. I did it for like a three years and it was so boring and I hated it. And I was just, just struggling so hard to figure out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But I know that I love to eat. <laughs> Cooking is, uh, you know, fun to do for me. It was a hobby. And I traveled a lot with my friends and I wanted to cook often but I never thought that I would be a chef. And my mom is actually a chef and I used to help her out. And the more I thought about it and have more experience in her kitchen, I was very convinced that I could be a chef. And especially, I really liked that kind of vibes, energy in the kitchen. And my mom was making good connection with the guests. And they came to my mom's restaurant when they missed their mom's food. And when I see that kind of vibes and building that, you know, the, the bond and, you know, like connection with the guests and also becoming friends. And I really was into that kind of, you know, atmosphere and vibes. So um, I was one day like, why am I not doing this for the rest of my life? Because I love to eat and I love food so much. And 
I like cooking so much. Why don't I do this? So uh, at the age of 27, I decided to become a chef. Then I had like a two jobs as an English tutor and a translator and saved the money and came here in 2009 to go to the culinary instead of America. So you try all these other jobs. They're not the right jobs for you. And your mom, mm-hmm. who was in the culinary world, did she try to talk you out of being a chef? Because normally most parents try to talk their kids out of working in the culinary industry. Mm-hmm. And your mom knew firsthand mm-hmm. it's a difficult job. It's not very glamorous. Now you, you've mm-hmm. gotten to sort of a glamorous point in your career, but it really mm-hmm. is a struggle for a lot of it. So did your mom try to mm-hmm. dissuade you from going to the um, Culinary Institute of America in oh. Hyde Park? Oh my God. She was so mad at me. More than mad. She was upset for like a whole year and she stopped talking to me for like a uh, half year actually because uh, she number one, she didn't want me to leave Korea. She wanted me to stay close to her, and she told me this is a very hard o- occupation and it's not really fun. And then, you know, they have a, like a stereotype, like a nine to five. Uh, actually, my parents worked really hard uh, to get me a better career in life. So they they were like, you know, being a chef is a, like a, still a working class. She thought it was the back then. And she was like, why do you want to do this? You know, it's tiring. You are at some point start, you are supposed to settle down, have kids and have a better life and stuff. But you can't do that with, uh, with your career, right? That you're looking for. So she was a very mad that I was trying to leave Korea and her. And also, you know, not getting a normal occupation wasn't uh she was expect she expected so she was very disappointed upset for a very long time so where does your mom cook in korea where's the restaurant and where did you grow up uh she had uh two restaurants in seoul like a kimchi restaurant she um uh, actually is a kimchi chef she makes one of the best chefs one of the, she makes one of the best kimchi in Korea, and my uncle is a farmer. So my uncle grows cabbages, rice, chilies, and all the ingredients. And my mom makes like 3,000 cabbage a year for the restaurant. Wow. And she serves like a braised pork belly with the kimchi and stuff like that. Uh, just Korean soul food, but every dish has a kimchi. And uh, she was very successful for a long time. And she was on TV. She did some cooking competition in Korea. And now she's retired and home and cooking <laughs> all the time. Did you ever work in the restaurant as a little kid? Did you cook in the kitchen? Did you bus tables? Did you do anything like that in the restaurant? No, actually, my mom opened the restaurant like 20 years ago, so I didn't have an opportunity to work at a restaurant. Uh, but my both of my parents worked really late or often when I was a little child. So I had to learn how to cook and cook for me and my brother. And so when you're cooking those things as, as a young kid, what type of things are you putting together in the kitchen? Are you cooking always, was it, Korean staples? Were you messing around at that point and trying new flavors out? Or was it pretty traditional dishes, easy stuff that you were cooking? My favorite thing as a kid, my favorite thing to eat as a kid was egg. So I was always cooking eggs when I was a little. Then uh, when I entered the high school, I started to play like making some Chinese sweet and sour pork and deep frying all the porks and made a huge mess at home. Getting, you know, got my, you know, my mom always yelled at me. And I sometimes I make like a kakatsu and I made some steak and I, I did a lot of experiment. You know, I was found some, I found some like a cook fun recipes from the magazine and I wanted to play with it and having friends over and made a huge mess often. <laughs> When you arrived uh, in the United States to go to the CIA, Mm -hmm. you were 27 years old? 
I was 29. 29. So were you older than most of the folks at the CIA that were starting out in culinary school? And so what was that experience like? Because you were probably, you were on the, you were on the sort of the second part of your career. You were embarking on a new stage of your career. And probably a lot of those people, they'd never had a real job before in their life, right? Culinary school was their version of college, right? Mm -hmm. So what was that like? Mm -hmm. You had a lot more world and life experience than them. Uh, For me, coming from, you know, I was definitely older than most of other students at the CIA. But for me, it was a huge transition from Korea to New York and age difference, of course, but also cultural background. And I am starting something new. I'm learning something new in a new culture, in a new language. That was very overwhelming. And in the class, you know, I studied English before I came here. And my uh, English teacher would taught me like, uh, hi, my name is Jay. I, you know, they would say, and how are you? I'm fine, thank you, and you. There's a, like a formula, but everyone is saying, what's up? <laughs> hey, yo, and all this stuff. I yeah, was like, totally. Oh, I didn't really know how to respond to all this. So a huge language barrier and then like learning new things and then, you know, sitting in a classroom with a bunch of young kids. Uh, it was definitely overwhelming, but also uh, that was actually the best thing that I've ever done for myself. Uh, doing, you know, chasing my dream and think doing things that I really, that makes me really happy and excited. And so you graduate from CIA and what's your first job out of school? Oh, so I did my internship in New Orleans when I was at the school, and it was 2009 when Saints won the Super Bowl, and I also experienced Mardi Gras, and I fell in love with the food, music, culture, jazz, and, you know, the culture there, like a Southern hospitality, everything. So after school, I moved down to New Orleans and spent four years. And I worked at, I started working at restaurant August. And I also worked at uh, Dominica Herb Saints. And I also worked at Dookie Chase, where Chef Leah Chase uh, used to cook there. And so is that, that's when you started kind of developing your own style, right? Which is obviously the the project that you've launched now, which we'll get into in greater detail, which is sort of a mixing of all these yeah. flavors and ideas that you've encountered over your years cooking. But the real impetus for your restaurant that exists in New York, it started in New Orleans. So can you talk a little bit about mm-hmm. those flavors when you first encountered them, when you moved to New Orleans and you started tasting that Cajun cuisine for the first time? What was that like? What 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 did you love about it? And what which of those flavors did you find so exciting? Well, uh, when I was in New Orleans the first time, I was so shocked when I tasted shrimp and grits. That's the first dish that I tasted in New Orleans. And I could relate to Korean like a porridge, like a kanji. But also it's so creamy and comforting. And the spice there, like, and pickles. Uh, When I went to a farmer's market in New Orleans, I found this green tomato pickles. And I was like, why don't I make kimchi out of this? So there was... There were everywhere I, when I was in New Orleans, it was just everywhere. Every day I w- was inspiration. I went to the farmer's market. I see different things, but I also, it's like a Korea and the New Orleans is like 7,000 miles, but it's also very close. We love spices. We love barbecue, seafood, pork, and soup and rice. You know, the greens, pickles, marmalade, and all the preserves. I can relate. I can talk about this all day long, but like I was so happy in when I was in New Orleans, just finding all these differences, but also similarities. And I just fell in love with this so much and I was so excited. But there were definitely, you know, different parts, but I could tell 
I always said that all that. Like, we had something like that in Korea when I was in New Orleans. So I started to blend this. And I kind of thought, at the, you know, I did some experiments and stuff, like making okra, kimchi, stuff like that. And then it came out really well, not at the first time, but I had to, you know, you know, experiment a couple of times, but it came out really well, actually. And um, the more I started, to, you know, the more I started to blend these two cuisines, the more I got so excited and passionate about this and people actually liked it. So I did some pop-ups and I could see people are loving it and they get really passionate about it. So that kept me going also. And yeah, that's how I came up with the Cajun. What did you serve at your first Cajun pop-up? Was it a was it a single dish or was it did you pop up and actually do a full menu somewhere? Uh, I actually did the full menu, but you know, the Korean sweet potato starch noodle called the japchae noodle, I did it with a Gulf Coast seafood, like, a, you know, um, the blue crab and um, oysters and uh, Gulf shrimp. And I mixed that noodles and served with like, um, you know, the bell peppers and celeries and the Trinity vegetables. That's how I started. And you know, I also make like a steam bun, but with a like um, cochon de lait, you know, like a New Orleans classic whole roasted uh, suckling pig dish. I cook the pig and I served with my steam bun, you know, you know, sandwich, stuff like that, too. And I made like, a, you know, the the lacquered pork belly with green tomato, gochujang lacquered pork belly with, a, you know, green tomato kimchi. And I also did like okra pancake with a tomato and Creole tomatoes. And I, yeah, I've done many different like experiments and it has been fun. And I just, it wasn't like my 80 year old project that I've been just detailing over years. What was the initial feedback like from people that lived in New Orleans that weren't in the culinary industry? Obviously, people in the culinary industry, you're talented, you're doing something exciting, they're going to like it, they're going to gravitate to something that maybe they've never tried before. Were there people that had never tried Korean food before and that had never tried a Korean version of Cajun cuisine before? Were they they surprised by it? What was their kind of reaction? There is only one or two Korean restaurants in entire city in New Orleans. So they don't really know much about Korean food, but they tasted it. it. Actually, they were like very open to try it. And then they thought it was very different, but also somehow they could relate to their mom's cooking dish. Uh, you know, like they're like, oh, this is very spicy, but I like that heat. And like a kimchi juice, I saw people eat, they make the, you know, the <laughs> biscuit and then dip it there. Instead of using the gravy, they were making, dip their, you know, uh, biscuits into kimchi juice and then serve with the kimchi and the sausages and stuff. And then uh, when I used to work at uh, Dookie Chase, Chef Leah Chase was always so curious about Korean cooking. She asked me many questions questions about it and we talked actually a lot about Korean cooking and we actually made Korean dishes together but she was like yeah it's very interesting in New Orleans we eat a lot of greens and cabbage and we also eat soup and rice and we just found we every day out there we just discovered a lot of similarities between the Korean and New Orleans cooking and it was just my dream one day. I want to serve this Korean and New Orleans cuisine to many people. And it's happening. So I am very excited and thrilled. Yeah, I love all the parallels that you've described where even though they, they are not the same cuisine, there are so many overlapping uh, elements and there are flavor profiles that can be found in both. So you've been able to to match things up and do textures and flavors that kind of work with each other. So this mm -hmm. new project, tell me about it. Uh, 
it's in New York. We're, we're not in New Orleans anymore. Now you're in New York City. So uh, why do you choose New York for it? Beyond just being here, you know, like, did you think of other cities that it might work in? Or did you say New York or bust? I'm definitely opening up my spot here. I don't want to do it anywhere else. Um, actually, yeah, I've been working and living in New York City for the last seven years. So I would say New York is my home. And in the middle of a pandemic, Cajun, KJUN is a Korean and Cajun. That's, I, that's what I came up with. Uh, I started in the middle of a pandemic in a ghost kitchen. So I couldn't get a job and I, everyone last year was, what are we doing? And all the chefs and restaurants are closed. Uh, I started to think of what I can do and actually Cajun could be something. And so I just literally walking around the street and I found this empty uh, kitchen and I just walked in and said, hey, do you guys want to share some space with me? I'd like to do some pop-up. Um, that's how I actually started. And they were also desperate with, the, you know, not having any much, you know, business. So we shared some bills and that's how I started. And when I started, actually, I wanted to sell, I always said, I might sell five fried chicken a day. I don't know, maybe a couple of gumbo. I'm just going to work by myself. Uh, the reaction was really <laughs> different than I expected. And I sold out fried chicken every day. There was a line and people were very supportive and passionate about it. I am really greatly thankful for. And yes, I started in New York. And of course, I would like to have brick and mortar here. And once it's happening, I would like to have another restaurant in New Orleans because New Orleans is my home. And it wasn't just a great experience for me. It was for me as growing up as a chef. And it was definitely a new chapter of my life. And I still go there once in a while. And my friends say, oh, welcome home. You know, it's definitely. So uh, I would like to go back to New Orleans one day and have another Cajun restaurant. I want to talk a little deeper about the actual creation of this yeah. in the midst of the pandemic. So if you can talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, so you were, you were working somewhere, of course, mm -hmm. early March rolls around and everything shuts down. And then, you know, do you consider yourself an impulsive person? Was this a snap decision to go and find this ghost kitchen? Or are you a planner? Did you really think about it for a long time? Like, take us through the process of, you know, losing your job and then launching, mm -hmm. launching this concept, the Cajun concept. Yeah, so I really, it wasn't my impulsive thing or anything like that. I thought about Cajun for a very long time and I've been very careful. I didn't want to mess up or I wanted to start, you know, when I do it, I want it to be great. So I was mentally thinking about it for a whole time. I've been updating the menus and I taking notes on the, you know, all this stuff over years. So I have my own recipe. I had my own like menus and everything on my own. And I've been updating every time I had an idea. And pandemic, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I wanted to do it for like a month or two. And I wanted to start very, very small. And I wanted to see how far I could go from there. So I just literally brought up pots and pans from my apartment and uh, invested $3,000. <laughs> Uh, that's how I started last year. And, uh, after a few months, all the pots and pans from my home are not, of course, they are not heavy duties. So I had to toss them, but they were the community actually in Upper East Side were very, very supportive. And they actually wanted to support me to grow. So I got to buy all the pots and pans and trays, all the equipment that I needed. And I also, also, uh, paid off the, the, the initial $3,000. And yeah, so, and I was like, maybe I was at the beginning when I said, when I started, I wanted to have fun and I wanted to do something great, but I never thought that it would last that long, to be honest. 
So how did you get the word out about this? You know, there's lots of people that listen to this show and that work in hospitality. They want to launch a pop-up themselves. They're dreaming about what their own concept could be. You realize this dream, you put it into effect. So, uh, you know, what were those initial startup costs? And uh, and then how did you uh-huh. promote it? You know, beyond just going on social media, how did you make people get excited about the pop-up? Oh, well, so first I just literally spent like uh, four months alone by myself in my apartment, frying chickens and doing all the recipe tasting, testings. And I had to spit out all the fried chicken that I made. (laughs) So first two months was just cooking, cooking, cooking and working all myself, all by myself. But also I have some friends who are entrepreneurs not in the food industry, but they are very successful. So I just called them, I, hey, I'm thinking about doing this pop-up and I would like to get some of your devices. So I started to make a lot of calls to uh, my friends or I called my friends, do you know anybody who is an entrepreneur? So I started to make a phone call and I did all, so many Zoom calls, so, uh, getting their um, devices. There were some people who wanted to be partners and I wasn't sure if it's a good start. It's a, it's a good way to start, you know, from the very beginning. So I was just asking a lot of questions and taking notes. And that's, I don't, you know, like that's, I was just asking a lot of questions and from the experts that I would say that I, people that I would look up to and working by myself mostly and I came up with the logo. I drew the logo and I was asking someone who can draw it, you know, and then send, you know, give me a file. And then uh, came up with the name. I opened the uh, account, bank account, the credit card. I did like the first four months all by myself to minimize all the cost. And there were still a few people who want to be uh, like investors, but I don't want to get to that, you know, I don't want to take the investment too early because I want to make the this Cajun my Cajun. <laughs> and I'm still working on it, but in the middle, the first four months was just working alone and, you know, think about all this and uh, getting all the, you know, uh, devices. And then once I thought, okay, the recipes are ready, and then I have the venue. I started to reach out to like all the media, writing them an email. Hey, my name is Jay. I'm a chef. Uh, I'm starting this pop up, and I just want this is my own first, you know, startup. And I started to write about like very detailed information about Cajun. And some med, you know, some. Uh, uh, the media was interested and they wanted to have an interview. That's how I started. But still, I'm doing all the social medias. And uh, I took pictures and post on my Instagram all by myself and responding. I do touch everything right now, like every little part. Yeah, obviously, you get to have full control that way. But at a certain point, it becomes sort of unsustainable because you're you're firing on all cylinders at, at all times. And that can be pretty exhausting, even though you get to oversee all of it. So what's your plan over the next you know, year or so to expand Cajun and also maybe alleviate, hopefully, some of these burdens that you've got going on when you are really, you are a one person show right now to a certain extent? Yes. Yeah, so uh, right now I am focusing on opening another Cajun. In a few weeks, I've been talking to the local restaurants and uh, uh, markets, you know, and I'm respond. I'm waiting for their response right now. So my plan is to have another pop up for maybe five to six months, and by the end of the year or early next year, I would like to have my own space that I don't need to move here and there. Uh, until then, uh, I still like to create new dishes and test and see their reactions and what they think. And I just want to, you know, develop and, you know, all the details and stuff right now. So what does a dream uh, 
brick and mortar location look like to you in terms of size and location and all that? Like, what do you, what do you envision being the type of place that you want to spend maybe the next five or 10 years, uh, you know, looking out from the past, probably at your restaurant? What is it? What do you envision it being like? Oh, uh, I would say it's, I would like to have like, um, I don't want it to be too big, but I still don't want to be too, so small. Um, I see good passion and love for Cajun, and I would like to share with many New Yorkers and many other visitors to New York. So I would say I like to have maybe 50 to 70 seats and um, just uh, in a local area where people can just feel comfortable wearing flip-flops and shorts, you know, no suit. <laughs> And I don't want, I want them to come and just eat good food and laugh loud. And when they are leaving, I want to, I want them to say, I had such a great time here. That's all I'm looking for. And I would be very happy, but also I have so much, so many different ideas and I am very creative as a chef. So even if I have my own Cajun, at some point, I like to close Cajun and have my own different, you know, style of cuisine and play with it sometimes. Because I also don't people, I also don't want people to, you know, I, do, I also don't want people to get sick of Cajun as well. <laughs> so if you were to, you know, what's another area that really interests you? Like if you would, would it be a more traditional Korean restaurant? Is it totally something completely different that has nothing to do with Korean food like what would that what what else are you really interested in in the culinary space what's exciting to you he will be when you walk into the restaurant I want him to feel oh this is Jay I think that's me uh you know I'm Korean but I also learned how to cook in New Orleans and that's my core as a chef so it should be one of a kind very unique, uh, special place in New York City. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Eli, and I want to tell you about Magic Mind, a little magic elixir that makes you focus better on your work, be more creative, and drink less coffee. It's the world's first productivity drink. Magic Mind is a mix of 12 functional ingredients that makes you focus and that can help you fight off stress. It's created to be taken daily for a sharper mind, steady energy, and immune support. And this drink is for people like you, creators, entrepreneurs, cooks, freelancers, artists, and hospitality professionals. Athletes have Gatorade, and now you've got Magic Mind. So try starting your day off with Magic Mind in place of your morning coffee. You could sip it, chug it like a shot, or even turn it into a delicious matcha latte with your milk of choice. I've got a special offer for you, the listeners of Heritage Radio Network, from the folks over at Magic Mind. All you have to do is go to www.magicmind.co forward slash HRN, and you can use the discount code HRN at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Welcome back to The Line on Heritage Radio. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Let's jump back into the episode with Jay Jung here on Heritage Radio Network. So let's talk a little bit about this TV show. So tell me a little bit about how that Mm. process was. (laughs) How did that come to be? And, uh, and what can you share with me right now? You know, what season is it? And I'm sure there's some top secret information that that you can't share. But um, tell me what you can. Yes. So uh, last year, the Top Chef producers reached me out. And I did some processes. Uh, all the I, I went through all the process, and I got accepted. And I uh, while I was doing the top, you know, while I was doing a Cajun, so it was a huge decision for me to make: should I continue this pop up, or should I close and go to Houston to do this Top Chef season nineteen? It was a huge uh, decision for me to make. And everyone that I was, who are in the, you know, business, like not in the food business, but everyone says you should definitely, you know, do it. And then also for me, being on Top Chef was a very special, I thought, because 
Uh, I came from Korea and I to go to the culinary school in 2009. And back then in the dorm room, my favorite activity was watching Top Chef with my classmates. And now I am grown up as a chef and I am on the show. And that was a very also emotional, but also very, for me, it was like a monumental kind of moment for me. So I definitely thought that it would be worth to close my business and do the Top Chef. And I will be so proud when I get older and I will tell myself, you know, you came to America to be a chef and you become a chef and you did the Top Chef. That must have been such a wild moment for you when you entered the set for the first time. You know, pretty much everyone in the food industry and millions of people that aren't can totally visualize what the Top Chef kitchen looks like. And there's the judges table. And of course, we all know the judges, they're super famous. So what did it feel like that first day? You're in your whites and you walk in and you actually have to compete. What did you feel like when that was going on? Oh my God, it is such a nerve wracking. Like you, it, there's so many different emotions. Like you are excited to be there. Also, you are so nervous and the judges are intimidating and you don't know any other contestants and you don't know how capable they are. And you don't know, you don't know anything. You don't know what you get into. You don't know any challenges about it. You don't have any taste of it and just... You just have to believe in yourself. That's all you got. <laughs> and uh, uh, looking back, it was a really a cool, fun experience, to be honest, and one of the definitely the most memorable experience. And uh, I don't know if I want to do this again. <laughs> um, yeah, but I am really grateful for this opportunity to meet all the talented chefs there. Was there ever a moment when you know, off camera or in downtime when you were all kind of comparing and getting to know each other. I mean, where you've worked, you've worked in two phenomenal food cities and, and, you know, a couple of restaurants that you've worked at are known worldwide and the rest of them are known, you know, in the United yeah. States, they're, they're all very, very well respected restaurants. So when you started comparing notes did you get a little bit more confident knowing, you know, what your background was and where you had come from? Or were you still mm-hmm. feeling overwhelmed and nervous? Actually, the other contestants were also, they have an amazing resume. Like some of the people have experiences in New York, in Europe and working for the one of the best chefs in the world. Uh, just... Being yourself was intimidating, I'm not going to lie. But also, I believe that I am intimidating for them and knowing that we are equal, you know. So I just wanted to be myself and I wanted to just cook my food, pretty much. That was my plan. And yeah. Did you get did you get an opportunity to showcase what you believe is your your cooking identity and your cooking personality? Did you get to make dishes? I mean, obviously there's challenges and you're you're confined often by what the ingredients are and the challenges, but do you feel like you got to cook your own food while you were on the show? Uh, actually, that was my goal to cook my own food and to share. The reason that I did the Top Chef was I believe I have a great food and story to be shared with uh, many others. Uh, so for that reason, I believe I accomplished my goal when I was at, at the show and when I was doing the show and I was very happy that I was able to cook my food that, you know, that represents my culture, Korea, and also New Orleans and my experience in New, New York City. Who was the first person that you called when you got accepted? Did you call someone in the food industry or did you call a family member? Um, I don't really remember, but when they called me that I would be on the next Top Chef, I know that I was crying. <laughs> uh, it was very, for me, it was very um, crazy to see myself making this far, coming along from Korea. And I was as culinary students watching Top Chef. And now I am on Top Chef. 
<laughs> that was uh, really crazy. Yeah, you did two things during COVID that barely anyone else has been able to do, which is you launched a business during COVID <laughs> and then you went on national TV during COVID. Most people were staying at home that entire time. Yeah. And, and, you know, you got to actually accomplish some things, but it must have been really scary during COVID when you were launching your business. Were there weeks when you were prepping by yourself for Cajun? I know you said that there were lines and that it was successful, but you know, as a person doing a pop up, do you feel like at any moment people might not show up that week, or or did you start to get more and more confident as time went on? Actually, I like I said, uh, the even um, the, there were a lot more people who wanted to get my food than I expected. Uh, so, and I was always understaffed, and I was always you know have shortage in prepping situation. And I really didn't want to stretch and compromise the quality, though. That was one thing that I learned the most from Le Bernardin. Uh, once I ran out of certain ingredients, I didn't go to a local store and then just served whatever, like, you know, buying like a, some cheap ingredients and then just try to serve the food. I just closed right away. <laughs> You know, I thought it was really important to make people happy. Even if they didn't get my food, they will come back. But if once they are disappointed, uh, they wouldn't come back, you know. So for me was uh, also I see all the efforts, you know, coming from Westchester, New Jersey, Brooklyn, Queens, all the all different boroughs. And I didn't I really wanted to make their trip worthwhile. So I don't want to say, you know, if they said, oh, I drove two hours to get the food and the food wasn't that great, they will, you know, break my heart. And there were, you know, many people coming from Westchester, upstate New York, Long Island, New Jersey. And I really didn't want to, I wanted to make them feel like, oh, the trip was worthwhile to get the kind of food. Could you describe a dish for us, a Cajun dish that you feel really is an exemplary version of what you're trying to accomplish. And if you can describe not only the components of the dish, but, uh, you know, where you draw the inspiration from in the dish, maybe which parts are Cajun or Korean or, or which parts are both. If you could um, just talk us through one that you think is, is one of your favorites. Uh, it's really difficult for me to pick one dish because every dish I love so much. And I thought about the, before I put it on the menu, I thought about it for months and years. So every dish I would say is very well thought out, but um, there are a couple dishes that I would like to mention. Um, kimchi jambalaya is one of the staples. Uh, it is not kimchi fried rice. People think, oh, kimchi jambalaya. Maybe she made a kimchi fried rice with andouille sausage. But it's definitely, definitely, it tastes like jambalaya, but the kimchi is so necessary and plays a role, plays a, plays a very important role as a hot sauce in there. And also um, gumbo is very special for me. Like gumbo for me is like, a, I make gumbo, you know, as it's like a, Every time we have a storm in the city and then just when we have nothing to do, that's my, my favorite thing to do, like making gumbo at home. And I learned how to make gumbo from all the best chefs in New Orleans. And when I make gumbo, I every time I do make gumbo, I think about all the faces and names who taught me how to make gumbo. One day I spilled the five gallons of gumbo and I got yelled at so much. I think about that moment too. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I think about the, uh, the Chef Leah Chase, her gumbo, and also their Cajun gumbo and Creole gumbo, but also I made my own gumbo from putting all their tricks and seasoned it with a soy sauce, hot sauce, and served with this okra kimchi that makes the dish very special. So, um... It's like, you know, Cajun for me is my own baby. And if you pick your favorite child, 
it's really hard to. <laughs> I never had a baby, but I can feel. I totally, what, I get what you're what saying. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw that you were doing king cakes. That was for Mardi Gras. Yes. And so those, that was a special order and, uh, and that sold out. But I'm wondering if people want to uh, yeah. try your food in New York City, uh, how can they do it? Do you post on your Instagram when your next pop-up is going to be? Like, what's the best way for people to try your food right now? Or are you kind of taking a pause while you're promoting Top Chef or how does that work? Uh, so uh, all this information and every all the uh, update will be on uh, Cajun Instagram, K-J-U-N-N-Y-C. Uh, I post on the stories all the time to communicate with the people. And, um, you know, there's a, in a market called Butterfield Market on Madison Avenue in New York City. They have Cajun food once in a while. And I post on my Instagram when I delivered the food to Butterfield. And I'm working hard on the reopening. Uh, I believe it will happen in a few weeks or so. So keep, please follow us on Instagram and stay followed and for any updates. <laughs> Chef, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me about Cajun. Uh, super exciting to hear about the pop-up. I'm really looking forward to it happening again or a new, maybe a new brick and mortar in the future. That sounds like it's definitely going to be in the plans. And uh, congratulations on Top Chef. Uh, you, once we stop recording, you can tell me if you won or not. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and, you know, everyone out there that's listening, uh, make sure to follow uh, the Instagram so that you can stay up to date on all the information. And, of course, let's plug the show as well when our new episode's coming out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much for having me here and uh, giving me an opportunity to share my stories and, you know, Cajun and all. I really appreciate it. I had such a great time. Of course, it was my pleasure. Great to talk with you. When can they see the the next episode of Top Chef? Do you know when it runs? So tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow is day one. Okay. <laughs> tomorrow, day one. All, All right. right. Cool. Uh, so everybody out there, check out Jay on Top Chef. And of course, uh, follow Cajun NYC on Instagram. That's K-J-U-N. NYC. Thank you. And you can also watch the Top Chef on uh, Bravo at 8 p.m. every Thursday. Hi, I'm Katie Mosman Wadler, Executive Director of HRN. HRN is dedicated to amplifying small businesses that keep our communities vibrant. Today, I'm asking business owners to take part in our business membership drive by supporting HRN's mission with a $500 membership. HRN will shine a light on your work, and you'll help sustain our mission to expand the way eaters think about food. As a thank you for this tax-deductible donation, your business will receive on-air mentions, social media posts, listings on our website, and more. You'll also play an essential role in keeping nonprofit food radio on the air. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash biz to become a business member today. That's heritageradionetwork.org slash B-I-Z. Thank you for your support. The line is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at Facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners just like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.
I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.